Perry, perhaps to you, um, you whizzed through that last part of your presentation uh, quite quickly, um, and in your quest for uh, us to be more environmentally intelligent, um, you talked about this you know, new dynamic model and uh, improved user focus. Can you expand a little bit on wh what that actually means in terms of the tools that, that we'll be able to use? Yes, um, just to give a bit of an anecdote, we, uh, I think two years now, ran a fairly extensive uh, uh, user test, a survey, I guess, of people who use our, our seasonal forecast, sometimes people who are very used to using it, and basically gave a comprehension test. Uh, and what we found is that nearly 60% of people often misunderstand the forecast in its present form. And we also road tested a few sample ways of doing the forecast, 10 in fact, and our current one came last out of the 10 when we actually uh, polled people. So uh, that's told us that we have significant problems with our current forecast product and we're seeking on the communication front to address those, but also in order to improve the underlying quality of the forecast, uh, we, uh, uh, we need to move to the dynamic model. Now it won't overnight produce fantastically superior forecasts, but over time, as computer power continues to increase, as these models continue to develop, as more data is collected from satellites and elsewhere and fed into those, we expect that the skill of those models will improve, much as in the same way that weather forecasting over the last 20 years has significantly improved, so that the, the three-day forecast now is as good as the one-day forecast was about 10, 15 years ago, for example. So um, the other big plus, and is what I alluded to, is that the dynamic model gives, opens up the opportunity to explore uh, or to find, to be able to make reasonable forecasts in relation to how, uh, right, say for example, rainfall might be distributed over a three month period rather than just whether it's above or below average and therefore also an opportunity to give some advanced warning of whether this season is likely to have heat waves or is likely to have floods and so in a, in a much more uh, in a much better way than we've been able to previously. So it holds out the prospect, they're going to be further down the track, um, obviously, and as we develop the model, but we're making an initial transfer over to the new model system this year, and the advances in our user design should, in the year following should uh, appear on our website, and with things like a video presentation for those who find reading a two-page document a little bit mind-numbing and so on. So we're looking at that communication side as well. Terrific, thank you. And a question, sir, up the back. Uh, Jonathan Burnett uh, from the Australian Macadamia Industry. Hi, Lucy. Hi, John. Uh, I can't quite see you up there. Uh, my question is for John. Very interested in what you had to say. I thought that was a fascinating presentation. How applicable do you think your sort of approach might be in an industry like mine, Macadamia's, where there are inherent structural differences in the value and, and productivity of the enterprises? due, if nothing else, to the age of the trees, the variety of the trees, and the spacing of the trees? Um, it's a very good question, and um, I think when we first set up uh, Bullabara and we were just looking at, you know, Broadacre, Broadacre is actually fairly simple um, compared to other industries, and uh, I know that at the time um, there was a lot of interest, like from the grape industry and the horticulture industry, industry saying, could we do that in our industries? And our initial looks of that was, yes, but there's water, there's long-term plantings of different types, you know, different types of fruits uh, and uh, contractual arrangements. And, uh, but then the more we looked at it, it's just come back to that blank sheet of paper again and actually just pulling it all apart and then putting it back together in, in, into, in a structure. We're really confident you can do it with pretty much anything as long as you don't try and, um, I guess, suggest that because what, what works for a, a cereal farm or what works for a, a grape enterprise, there has to be similarities with what we might work for, for macadamias. You actually have to, there is no model, there are no rules. <laughs> so I think certainly that can be. Okay, Graham. Oh, I'm all right. Sorry. Do you want to chair, Graham? <laughs> um, um, thank you, hi, sir. Thanks. Bill Woodford, Rural Finance Corporation in Victoria. Just drilling down a little bit into your model, and I appreciate it's, it's different across industries, just interested in the role of finance in that model, uh, and particularly whether you looked at a level of sustainable debt for your business model or whether, in fact, your intention with all those, those great profits you make with drill is to pay that down to nothing. Um, debt's a really interesting 
uh, interesting um, part of it. And uh, I guess part of, part of the journey for us, and I can't answer that simply, uh, is that uh, you know when we first sat down with, with all the, the banks and we, we put our whole business up for tender and decided what we needed to do, and we were using all the parameters that are always normally in place for our type of businesses. Uh, and uh, in some ways that restricted us a little bit. And, and uh, I have to say that when we did put out for tender, there were some of the, the banks that, that uh, didn't want to have a bar of it because it just didn't look like it, uh, they couldn't get their head around it, I suppose, and others that fought tooth and nail to be part of it. And I guess what's happened is, is like with the rest of the business, that it's moulded and shaped over time. A and uh, if anything, with the, the blank sheet of paper approach has also happened with the finance. And so the type of you know, debt arrangements that, or finance arrangements we have in place are, are probably quite different to what most farming businesses have. And, and I think, you know, even I think one of the traditional, um, I guess, ways of looking at you know, debt has been all about you know, equity levels. Uh, and uh, we probably have challenged that a bit in the way that, that we're set up, because especially because our land is sitting outside of the outside of the operation. And uh, I think there's been a bit of a shift in, in the finance industry to be more about being uh, ability to, to repay or ability to, to finance. And if, if the profit levels are there, it actually probably does change those parameters just a little bit. Thank you. Right. Uh, Graham Pitt, I'm an agricultural consultant and farmer once. Um, John, the question to you is, would you talk more about the glue that you think holds this farming system together, where you see the succession planning going, and how many clauses have you got in your exit plan? <laughs> Let me just make a few comments. There are two farming systems around the world that worked. Uh, one was the cooperative farming system in Russia, but they did have to shoot. 20 million middle-sized farmers to get it to work, and the Israeli kibbutz that works quite well as long as you've got a lot of angry neighbours. Uh, I have worked in exactly the model you've described starting 30 years ago. I think you've got it all right that uh, land, labour and capital valued and rewarded separately, commercial wages, a good board. Uh, but I've, uh, and after 27 years, uh, the exit clauses, of which there were 27, should have been 40 because there weren't enough. And uh, it's now five family farms of sub-economic uh, standard. And I've also worked taking apart large family empires with 34 family members who all wanted to exit, who'd never worked on the farm, uh, and it wouldn't pay 5% dividend. How do you stop that decay if you don't believe in primogenitor? Um, that's certainly a very good question too. And we, we've only, um, in our business, has been going for four years, and I guess we've been uh, uh, inventing the wheel as we go along. Certainly, as you say, you know, uh, very important from day one is, is what is the entry and what are, what are the exit clauses as such. And um, I'm not going to suggest that we've got it all right or, or will get it all right. Um, I just would like to think that we have a professional structure in place which gives us the opportunity, especially knowing that we've got uh, independence within the business that is trying to keep that emotion out of it, which I think is, is one of the most significant uh, uh, parts of it. Um, so we, we would like to think that we can keep evaluating and moulding and shaping it over time. I wouldn't like to th think that it was going to get to the stage where we end up with 27 shareholders and then have to have to pull it apart later on. We've tried to structure um, Bulabara as such in such a way that it can be dismantled if needed be, but we also hope that it's going to be pr profitable and sustainable enough that no one uh, will really want to do that. As far as um, what you say about uh, about um, uh, succession, um, I think one it, it is actually one of the big benefits of it. Uh, I mean, with with you know with benefits, there's always pitfalls, but. Um, I've got two kids, I put them up before, a son 14, a, a daughter 10. My son um, isn't going to be a farmer, or at least he says that now. Uh, he has no great interest in the farm. There are so many farmers that I know of who are in a situation like me who then at this point of life, knowing their son and daughter aren't planning on coming home, are saying, well, I might as well sell up now, maybe, or do I stay on till I'm, till I'm 80 and I have to, have to look after it? 
in this type of model, and I said there is no one model, but this type of model, at least um, because we're rewarded in different ways within the business, in time I can actually step back and say, well, I've had enough, replace myself in the business, the land and the capital investment still stay there, my children inherit that, um, they st can still get a return from that. In 10 years' time, when my son comes home from uni, decides that he really wanted to go farming, the farm's still there, and he can still put himself, we can involve him in the business in a place where he adds the most value, as long as it's of value to the business. Um, so we see that probably the, the benefits of that outweigh the negatives. Um, I guess time will tell, um, but certainly we're very aware of that, and uh, it's something that we talk about strategically at board level quite a lot. Thanks, John. And a question up the back. Uh, Warwick Scherf from Horticulture Australia. Uh, John, sorry to keep you in the spotlight, but I'll follow on a bit more from uh, Graham's question, and that is around um, how do you uh, how do you envisage we, you take a model such as that and uh, and put it out there for consideration when, um, as we know, uh, far, uh, family farms in Australia are staunchly independent, so that. Uh, um, one success is measured by you know, the, 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 the level of independence you do have. So how do you, how do you turn that mindset around so that it is more receptive to looking at this as a possibility and, and the options that it might create? Uh, I might come to you and get you to help me to work out how to do that. It's actually very, very difficult, and it's probably been one of the biggest challenges that, that we have, I guess, CFA have had in the last few years, because we do believe in the model. Uh, we know that it does work, and uh, you know we've had lots of discussion with, uh, with the industry, especially in the horticulture industry and the grape industry, who all see the benefits, who all want to take credit for it, who all uh, their egos and politics fly everywhere. In fact, we've been working with probably with the grape industry for the last two or three years and uh, seriously hadn't got anywhere. At the end of the day, we just said, we go do it ourselves, which is essentially what we've done. And, and so uh, without any help, without any government assistance, grant assistance, we've put together these two ventures. We're working on a couple of others as well. And it's really been more people looking over the fence and saying, I want a bit of what they've got. And I, um, I would love to think there was a way of, of rolling it out further, and, and maybe there is, and, and maybe it needs uh, you know, some, some industry groups to get together to look at how that can best happen. Um, but uh, it, it, the problem is, and you, you hit on it exactly, it's a cultural change. It really is. And, uh, and when I've sat down and worked with farmers. We've been through a couple of meetings. I sit there and look at all the numbers and say, this is just fantastic. The numbers stack up. It's wonderful. They go home, and not go home because their wives are there as well, but then they go home. And, but to actually make that step is a huge, huge commitment. And it's those emotional barriers that you have to get over and the personality differences. And that's why it's just not for everyone. It really isn't. It? Thank you. Well, we need to wrap shortly, but if I might just ask one final question, perhaps to you, um, Peter, and you put up an interesting graph comparing productivity growth between the US, Canada, and Australia, and you know, we've already uh, seen a bit of unpacking of that today, and, and that you know, current productivity growth in Australia is very, very low, you know, 0.2%, I think. And I just wanted to perhaps ask you, you know, wh why is that? Is it just the seasonal issues that we face here in Australia? And I suppose the next thing is, you know, and, and what is the next big thing? Where do we need to look? Is it structural adjustment that John's been talking about today? Is it GM? You know, wh what is it? Okay, well, I suppose, first of all, on the, the productivity slowdown side of things, a large part of that is the, the poor seasonal conditions. Um, but we've also identified that um, there has been a, a slowdown in the growth of public R&D expenditure, and we've statistically linked that to the slowdown. So that's a, there's no short-term fix to that in terms of um, putting more money in today and getting an outcome tomorrow because the, the lags are so long. So that's a, a long-term challenge is to get the, the R&D environment right. Um, not just the, the public spend either, but also how to, re how to remove you know, impediments to, to private R&D expenditure. I think the, um, the comparison with the, with the US and Canada is quite interesting. Um, we think about the substantial reforms that have been undertaken uh, in Australia over the past 20 years, uh, and that has contributed to our productivity growth substantially. 
we still managed to, if you, t if you took out the slowdown, we would have kept pace with the United States. So I think the message out of that is we, we can't afford to take our eye off the ball in terms of the, the productivity challenge that's ahead of us because some other countries haven't gone through the same sorts of reforms that we have, so they probably have some scope to, to improve on the microeconomic reform side. Um, structural adjustment will be um, central to, to productivity growth going forward. So the key thing there is basically removing impediments to structural adjustment. So especially, especially if we think the climate's going to become more variable and there'll be more things for farmers to adjust to, we, ha we have to remove impediments to that happening and to operations being as flexible as possible. So I suppose that the long-term thing is really to have a good hard think about um, our R&D effort, whether we're making the best use of R&D that's done overseas, and what level of public R&D expenditure we need to be putting in here, because obviously, um, you know, budgets are tight, and uh, they, they, those are difficult decisions to make. And John, perhaps final word from you, where are you looking to further improve the productivity gains that you've, you've already started to see? I think for us, um, because I, we believe that it's the, the values that we have in the business are absolutely central to it. And so by creating an environment which uh, we all keep talking about efficiency, transparency, accountability, professionalism, I think that we just want to keep overlaying that into every aspect of the business. And by doing that, I think we're finding that there's one percenters that we can keep creating all the way through our business. And so we're actually not looking at, um, you know, we're not looking at necessarily getting bigger. We're certainly looking at getting better. Um, certainly, I don't think the message is uh, that it's all about getting big. It's actually about creating creating a, a business model that works, and uh, and we're certainly looking at building on that over the next few years. All right. Well, on that note, thank you for your participation. Thank you for your questions, and I'd like you to please thank our speakers: Peter Gooday from ABES, John Gladigo from Balabara, and uh, Perry Wiles from the Bureau of Meteorology. Thank you.